coming up. All you ever ask for is an opportunity. You got it today. Where else would you rather be than right here, right now? The Rock Pile Report with Buffalo Bills season ticket holder, Drew Gear. Be aggressive. You have literally nothing to lose. You're a borderline football team. If I don't keep laughing about this stuff, my teeth are going to turn around and devour my brain. The Bills make me want to... salary cap needed to be fixed going forward and you know it's not ideal to hand a set of coaches and players 50 plus million of dead money and you can whine about it um, or you could do something about it everybody to another edition of the rock pile report podcast i am your host bill season ticket holder drew gear That's my producer, Chris Krueger, and that was Brandon Bean from his season-ending press conference over at buffalobills.com. Dude, why are we doing this on a Monday? I could be on the couch watching The Bachelor. (laughs) That's exactly what you would be doing. Probably with a Seagram's on ice in a wine glass. Oh, we're doing it on a Monday night because we have a special guest joining us in studio tonight. We have hashtag sports Paul Wineski. How are you, sir? Hey, man. Hey, long drive from Lockport. I no, know. It's not a long drive. He, he comes all the way down here to join us. <laughs> Brought his calculator. He is essentially a human calculator when it comes to talking about salary cap. And that's the theme of tonight's show. Just talking about where we stand. It's our annual salary cap primer. We're going to be talking numbers. We're going to be talking a lot of different things. Now, Paul, Paul and his friend Mario create content over at Hashtag Sports. I don't know if you guys have seen their videos yet, but if you haven't, check it out on YouTube. It's called The Sunday Drive. Now, Link Paul, will be in the description of tonight's show to their YouTube page. Now, Paul, how has that been going for you guys this season? Oh, man. I mean, it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. We get in the car, we grab some uh, some Timmy Hoes, and we just drive around and, and talk football. You know, that that's really all it is. Um, I, it's, it's a very cool thing to do, to just set up a camera, get in the car, and you just drive. You know, and you just, you just have a conversation about football. Uh, we've got a, a, an amazing community of people that support uh, through the YouTube page, uh, through the comments, and um, we're super interactive, and a lot of our shows are based off of what everybody wants to hear. So if you want to hear a topic, you just let us know. We'll cut a video about it. You know? That's at HTAG Sports on Twitter? Yeah, that's right. And, folks, when he first got here, yes, for those of you who are wondering, I am sick. This is, But I was talking to Chris about it yesterday. I don't think I've missed a podcast yet since we started doing this due to illness. I have never been too sick to record, and I'm not about to start now. Yeah. <sighs> Even if it was the other way around and I was the one sick, believe me, I would be breathing on you any chance I get. <laughs> <laughs> the reason Paul is here in studio tonight, uh, in, in person, one of the big reasons was we had to get even on a bet. So, at the beginning of last year, yep. in his infinite wisdom, Paul declared that A.J. McCarron was going to start how many games? It's, it doesn't really matter how many I said. <laughs> I said start and finish the season as the Bills starter. We uh, didn't even make it to week one. That, that. <laughs> Dead what, on arrival. What a hysterical way to lose a bet. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> oh, man. I'll tell you. Thank God, thank God that season's in the rearview mirror. Well, whenever you look at, you know, somebody that you're really betting on, uh, and he played the whole uh, fourth preseason game, the entire game, all by himself, and you're like, "Oh man, this is this, this is guy's a, this guy's done." You kind of knew he's you done. were done then. Yeah. Oh, it was great. And now to see that he's over, he's back in Oakland with John Gruden. Yeah, oh, and man. Nathan Peterman. Nathan. Yeah, think if you're ever in like a bad part of your life when you're just depressed, just remember AJ McCarron got nearly replaced by Nate Peterman twice in one year. He, Peterman's <laughs> on the practice squad, so he's not officially replaced. But, uh, I mean, really, how cursed do you have to be to have Nate Peterman following you around for a oh, while? That's a good That's a bad call. year. That's a bad year. Well, we're not going to waste any more time. We're going to jump right into this with this week's Bills News Update. So long and happy trails. Mr. Marvin Allen is moving on. That's right. The look I just got from everybody at the table is who? Who, 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 who is this person? You didn't even know until I brought it up to you yesterday. No, I know. I, I I saw the articles. I just when you when you talk about people from your front office, not every fan out there is familiar with the people pulling the strings behind the scenes. The Bills national scout Marvin Allen. He's now been hired by the Miami Dolphins to serve as their assistant GM. You look at his resume. 
It's a big, that's a big jump. He's got a resume. I mean, he's been a scout since the 90s. He's held the titles of director of scouting, national scout, and now assistant GM. That's a huge jump up for him. Now, this is the second, I think it's noteworthy because it's the second season in a row the Bills have lost a prominent member of their scouting department to another team. Last year it was, uh, who was it, Brian Gain. Mm-hmm. Jump ship to be the GM of the Houston Texans. Mm-hmm. You want to talk about upgrades in position. You definitely got a better parking spot, I'll tell you that. Yeah, well, I mean, you see that stuff happen when um, there's changes in the front office. You know, um, as soon as you start seeing GM changes and guys, you know, start shifting around, um, changes in priority for these guys happen, right? Um, so, I mean, taking an, an AGM job anywhere, oh my goodness. What an opportunity that is. Oh, absolutely. Now, I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I know what kind of a t- tangible impact this is going to have on the team going forward. <laughs> but here's what I'll say. I'm encouraged by this. I'm encouraged by the underlying theme that exists here. Two years in a row, people who were in our building playing a prominent role for our scouting department, whether it be pro personnel, whether it be have received promotions and gone elsewhere, which means that we have somebody who's doing the hiring of the people working in our front office who has enough of an eye for talent, or at least is convincing enough, to get these guys with killer resumes to come into the building, and that these guys are respected enough that when they leave here, nobody's leaving here and taking a a step back in their careers. Mm. Everybody's being viewed as respected members of the community, and they're being... Elevate into higher positions. Well, I believe taking a job with the Dolphins is a step back. <laughs> I mean, you have to walk into work wearing teal. Oh, God, nobody wants that. Yeah, but you don't have to pay state income tax. There's no state income tax in Florida. Uh, so yeah. that's 8% right there. You're getting All right. that's an 8% bonus. Oh, see, the numbers guy. Leave yeah, it yeah, the numbers guy another tax there rate. Yeah. So. But no, in all seriousness, what it does is it says to me whoever put this staff together in the first place. He had to kind of have a, a feel for talent and the type of person it took to fill those roles for us. So as they move on, I'm I'm not I don't have a fear that we can't restock at those positions because it seems like we did a pretty good job of identifying people who would do well enough at them to earn promotion. Yeah, it's it says a lot after a six win season, right? <laughs> you know that you got a guy that's moving on to greener pastures, higher mm-hmm. of higher ground. Um, you know, to me, the one guy that. You're not going to want to see his name show up in the news feed. It probably, you might not even know it. It's Mark Lubbock, who was the offensive quality control. Um, and everybody looks at it and says, well, the Bills offense was, was, it, you know, it's terrible this year. Why would you even care about anybody on offensive quality control? Quality control is responsible for those first 15, 20 plays going into the first quarter, you know, going into the first quarter and then coming out of half. They work with the offensive coordinator to game plan all those adjustments. And that was the strongest part of the Bills' offense, head and shoulders, all season long, was that was that offensive script. Um, and that's what Mark Lubbock was responsible for. So that's a name that, if you see that name not in a Bills uniform next year, not on the Bills' website in 2019, that's that's a big loss. That's, oh. a, that's a big loss. Well, I guess that's, that's, that's one of the other storylines here that I'm not understanding. Anybody who's, obviously there's people out there who are Twitter junkies, NFL junkies, the way I am. You know, you get a free minute. You're sitting on the toilet, and the first thing you do is you open Twitter. You're or just, eating a sandwich. <laughs> there is no eating on the toilet. <laughs> we we have fought about this ad nauseum. I, it almost came to blows between me and a guy named Ryan Lacell because there's Your guest from a couple weeks ago. There's yeah. people yeah. out there who feel that it's okay to eat on the toilet. I'm not one I'm of them. I'm not one of them. No. I will never subscribe to this theory. This is nonsense food. It's like breaking the plane when you score a touchdown. The moment... Any food item crosses the threshold of the bathroom door, it immediately becomes tainted. It's garbage. You have to get rid of it. Yeah. I agree with you. I would, I would just bring it up as a counter argument. So with that, you know, you're sitting there, you're killing time, you go to Twitter, and the first thing you're looking for is football news. Mm. Well, I see all of this movement in position coaches. You know, we have our own vacancies to worry about. We have offensive line, a wide receivers coach. We need a special teams coordinator. And it's radio silence. Yet I'm watching all of these big names get shuffled around, and it doesn't sound like the Bills outside of um, – signed with Arizona just recently, former uh, – Kugler. Kugler. Outside of Kugler, there really wasn't a candidate out there that the Bills were being tabbed. It's like, hey, the Bills have significant interest in this guy or Mike Munchak or this guy or this name. There's nothing. 
I'm not hearing a word, and that's terrifying to me. I guess it makes you wonder who's responsible for it, right? So Brian Dable uh, had to work with a staff that he didn't hire, right? He's working with Denison's staff, who Denison didn't hire either. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of wonder who's going to be ultimately responsible for hiring in a new offensive line coach or a wide receivers coach. And if it is Brian Dable's responsibility, you have to question, well, if they're on a college contract, they have to do the same thing that the Bills did with Dable. They had to buy him out. They had to buy him out of his contract to get him here. So if they're looking at somebody in the collegiate ranks, that's something that you have to do. You have to buy them out of a lot of contracts from these colleges. So there's some negotiation that comes with that. So I, I'm not super surprised that it's taking a while um, because Bean and McDermott seem like they are not in a rush to fill any of these positions at all. There's no, no rush. They want to make the right hire when they feel like making it. And, um, you know, the big names aren't necessarily what they want. And, I, and I'm almost curious if it's because they don't want anybody to question the throne. You know, bringing guys of name that aren't going to kiss the ring. You know, that, that's I'm just curious <laughs> and concerned what, about it. What, what, what oh, I know. I, what? I know. Day Bowl's championship ring. That's it. Yeah, Day Bowl's <laughs> national championship ring. Roll Tide, sir. Roll Tide. <laughs> No, it's going to be really interesting. I'm assuming we're going to see some traction on that front in the coming weeks. But like I said, it's frustrating as a fan who wants to see the direction that this team is heading in. To see no traction on that front, it's frustrating. Yeah. Well, you know, and you also look at David Culley, who um, is the quarterback's coach. He was a wide receiver's coach. He, last time he was a quarterback's coach was 1988. It was the last time he held that position. It was 1988. And now he's the quarterback's coach for the Bills. Prior to that, he was the wide receivers coach. So a lot of people say, well, just shift Cully over to be the wide receivers coach and then hire another quarterback coach. Go get Jordan Palmer. Hire Jordan Palmer as your QB coach, right? Well, all that's well and good. It's not, it's good on paper, but let's not forget David Cully was the wide receivers coach when the Chiefs went 21 straight games without a touchdown reception from their wide receivers. I so remember you, that. You, yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah, same oh, guy. Only a same nerd guy. would remember you, that. Same guy. What do you mean it's the same guy? Same I would, guy. I would have assumed they would have burned him at the stake. <laughs> so did I. Witchcraft. This is <laughs> impossible. How do, same you, guy. how do you hold this position title and... Dwayne Bowe was his number one wide receiver. So, I mean, you have to, you have to come with a, like a little bit, you know, you have to, uh, you got to come to that, that topic with kid gloves on. But same guy. So again, you have to question yourself. You have to question, you know, do we really have the right people on the bus for the wide receivers coach position right now? I would not put David Culley in that, in that spot Jesus. at all. Well, folks, we certainly painted a bleak picture there. <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> let's, let's switch gears here and talk about something a little more entertaining, and that is the meat and potatoes of tonight's show. Our 2019 salary cap primer, and just, we want to take a look at all of this. Don't get mad at me, okay? But there's a lot of you out there who can probably agree with this opinion of mine. There are a lot of Bills fans out there with no clue how the salary cap actually works. Much less have a, who have a working understanding of how it impacts a team's decision making. Yeah, that would be you. That's why we have Paul here. Because <laughs> he understands it. Well, no, I mean, this is one of the reasons I had to stop listening to sports talk radio. When they're taking calls from people who call in with their sports opinion, and it's, we need to, get, we need to cut Marcel Darius, even though there's a huge amount of dead money involved in that. They don't see that. This is just a guy who, you know what I mean? You, you're talking about trading for Khalil Mack. Knowing that not only are you giving up significant draft capital to pull a move like that off in the first place, but a hundred million dollar plus deal is going to be necessary in order to make it worth it. That's it. So when you make a trade like that, you're already committing yourself to huge salary cap hits for the next six years. Massive. Yeah. So you, there's a long, it's not just, hey, trade away your first round pick next year and get this player. There are long-term ramifications for this. I mean, the conversation right now about it trading for Antonio Brown yeah. drives me insane. Mm -hmm. He's a 30-year-old wide receiver. Yes, he's been highly productive with a future Hall of Fame quarterback. That's not to say he couldn't thrive somewhere else. But the idea of trading away high draft capital and taking on massive cap hits for the next three years until he's 34? Mm -hmm. that yeah, just doesn't seem palatable. Yeah, that, that's the Steelers' problem to deal with, not the Bills' problem, right? When you sign a guy like Antonio Brown to a contract like that, you expect him to be with your organization till the end of time, right? That's that's what that deal is written for. Um, trading for trading for Antonio Brown is different than trading Antonio Brown, right? So the Steelers they're going to have to absorb a ton of cap, a ton of cap hit. Now the the difference there is they're getting a cap credit from Le'Veon Bell not playing, so mm -hmm. it's 
it's pretty close to a wash. They're going to take, I think, $21 million in a hit to get rid of Antonio Brown. $21 million they're going to have to take on the cap as a hit. But they're also getting, like, I think it's 16-something back for Bell. So it's it's really not all that bad to trade Antonio Brown. If Le'Veon Bell had showed up this season, Antonio Brown would not be traded. They, w- they wouldn't be able to do it. But um, they can because Bell didn't show up. But then to be the team who's got to acquire that and now has yeah. to account for this player and his money, that's again, that's a fan opinion of, hey, we need a good wide receiver. This is not the way to go about obtaining one. Not if you give a shit about the cap. And this is the thing. Continually competitive franchises have GMs that manage their cap well. Teams that don't go to the playoffs for 17 straight years, not so much. So what you so what we've seen for the last decade and a half from this Bills franchise has been it's you could take this and show it as a cautionary tale to future GMs in training. Look, here's all the moves. You, you don't go out and sign Mario Williams when your quarterback is a rookie and doesn't really have a super talented offensive line or dynamic rushing attack in front of him. To the most expensive contract a defensive player had ever yeah. gotten. Yeah. I mean, there's stuff like that out there that you could you could use as a cautionary tale. That's why I like doing this. It's an exercise of just sitting down and taking a look at what occurred over the last year, money-wise, what the impact of that is, and then trying to figure out how where we go from there. And then also on top of this, you learn math. <laughs> No. I will never learn math. You're not going to force my my ninth grade teachers couldn't force me to force that stuff down my throat. You, sir, you have no shot. I do want to point out just because the counter argument to the Antonio Brown thing, right? The counter argument is it's not that much money per year because when you trade a player, and this is important to remember for anybody ever talking about salary cap, when you trade a player and that player's on your team, you have to take their entire signing bonus that is left on their contract and that immediately goes against your cap, right? So if you sign into a five-year, $50 million deal and $30 million of it was signing bonus, if you trade them the next day, that $30 million is immediately on your salary cap. Um, signing bonus is you take however many years there are and divide it up evenly amongst the contract, right? So like with Antonio Brown, uh, just as an example, it's a four-year, $68 million deal. Um, $19 million was a signing bonus. So $19 million is divided up over the life of the contract. Um, so Antonio Brown's salary is only about 12 mil next season. So like you look at the position the bills are in and they make sense. They got the money to give. So you're looking at a $12 million Antonio Brown, an $11 million Antonio Brown in 2020 and a $12.5 million Antonio Brown in 2021. So I get the argument. I don't get, I I can't see the bills giving up that capital to get that player. No. And that's why I think, and I think under having an understanding of the long-term ramifications of it, Helps when you see the bigger picture. Yeah. When you kind yeah. of, you know, because there's every year there's fans who I don't know what the Bills are doing in free agency. Why, why are they signing Jordan? Po- you know, there's this safety and this safety are available. Why are they cheaping out and signing uh, Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer? Mm-hmm. I just don't want him because of what he would do to the locker room. Well, I think, yeah. he, I think he would destroy that locker room, and that's the only reason I, w- I don't want him. I, I feel like the Bills are pretty prepared, you know, with what they're willing to deal with. Like exactly. if there's if there's something that the Bills have done well, it is they know what they'll tolerate and what they won't. Um, so I think I don't think the Bills are in on Antonio Brown at all. No. You know, you make the phone call to make the phone call, right? You well, do you, it. You, you do you do, do your, your due, due diligence. diligence. Yeah, you do your due diligence. But um, I don't think the Bills are in any way in on Antonio Brown. Well, no, and so when you look at where we came from, this is why I say this. I don't think we're in on Antonio Brown or any of these big name. It sounds crazy. You're not going to hear it. Coming into this season, we were told that this was not a rebuilding year. It wasn't a reset that we were, hey, that we're going to go out there and we're going to field the most competitive team we can. And then Brandon Bean decided to, decided it was a good idea to hemorrhage $50 million in dead cap space. Hey, Brandon! How dumb do you think I am? That's a valid question. Yeah. You're telling me you're not rebuilding, but then you literally just took the salaries of what, four to five starting players for your team and just balled it up and threw it out the window. Yeah. But you did it because you had to find a way. You had to find a way to get over the hump of all of these past GM's mistakes. And I think one of the things we we may have even talked about a little bit on this show, previous GM's, I think it was around the time of the Sammy Watkins trade. Mm. When you looked at what we were doing when you really started to see them pare down the roster goes back to last year. We talked about how no GM had ever, had come in 
and just taking a scalpel to the roster and just said, look, we're going to drop this, we're going to cut that, we're going to just start hacking pieces off. In Buffalo, you mean. In Buffalo. Yeah. But that's refreshing because every GM before him tried to just make the previous previous GM's mistakes work. Mm -hmm. Just tried to work around them. Oh, you saddled me with this terrible contract. Well, I'll figure it out. You know, Doug Whaley comes in and still has Mario Williams here. He's like, okay, well, this isn't working and our team isn't getting more competitive. So let me see what other things I can finagle and cheap contracts I can sign. At some point, so it's it's like the national debt. You can't keep kicking the can down the road. Sometimes you do just have to bite the bullet. Mm. Otherwise, it never goes away. Right. Yep. And Bean made that decision, and it put us through what was a rough season. I mean, we saw that there was a lot of Sundays where we were not the – we were very rarely the more talented team on the field. I mean, is that fair? That's ex- exceptionally fair. The Bills spent, um, from a dollar standpoint, like – Twenty million dollars less on salary in cash this season than every other team in the NFL. Like it's not even close. It's not even close from a, from a cash spend standpoint. The salary cap's one thing. The physical dollars, the Bills weren't were in the basement by a mile. And I think that's because they knew. Look, we're going to absorb all the costs. Well, exactly. We can. Yeah. They they couldn't. They weren't. They the money that we're talking about. When you talk about dead money, you're talking about money that you've already paid. That now you're just accounting for. Yep. So yeah, they they couldn't spend money. They didn't have it to spend. So with that, you take a look at what they did spend, though, and there's there's return on investment. I think mm-hmm. I brought that up a couple times this season when I was talking about players like Kelvin Benjamin and some of the you know, just guys you look at and you're just like, why am I why am I paying you? Yeah. What am I paying you for? Sure. So when you take a look at that, there were some players who fell into you know, a couple different categories. First, the best cap values for the Buffalo Bills in 2018. April, I know all this, okay, but I do like hearing it, so go on. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. You probably have all heard some of this before, but I'm going to tell you again because it's fun to talk about. Wide receivers Robert Foster and Isaiah McKenzie. In my book, those are fantastic cap values. You're talking about Foster coming in at just a quarter of a million dollars. McKenzie, just a hair over a quarter of a million dollars. That's low-hanging fruit because you're talking about two players who together made just over half a mil, who got you 786 total yards of offense on a team that starved for playmakers and scored nine total touchdowns. Did you include the amount of gas that McKenzie needed to get on and off the field? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, Chris and I were having this debate yesterday talking about Isaiah McKenzie when I brought up his I, value to the cap. I think he left the field three or four times on a cart, and you're like, oh, this is not good. He's not coming back. And then the next drive, he's on the field. Or you just see him walking around on the sideline. And it's like, you know, are they taking the gas for the car out of his paycheck? Because they should be at this point. What are we doing here? He's fragile. He's fragile. <laughs> well, it's Italian. When you take a look at what they brought on the field, I mean, Foster, the highlights of his year can't be, can't be, I mean, I can't underscore this enough. First of all, he came in at a time when our offense was floundering. We had nothing. We were going into a Jets game that our, our Jets correspondent, Joe Blewett, was very, very confident that their defense was just going to snuff out our offense completely. You've got Matt Barkley starting his first game in, how, what, two years? Yeah. Playing in his first action in two years. You've got a wide receiver core that, with two brand new faces on it, young kids who have never played in this offense before or with that quarterback. Mm-hmm. And instead what you saw was a wide receiver who had six foot two runs like – like when you see these small speedster wide receivers, he runs like they do. Yeah, Foster's not that. He's not this. He's not these little guys. No, he's not these but little he, guys. He, at but all. he has wheels. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you saw that game. Our offense start to open up. Mm. And our, you know, in that game was the perfect showcase of for both of these players. Isaiah McKenzie comes in. He's an offensive and special teams contributor. He takes. I, I remember watching us run a jet sweep with him, and it was the first one we had run all year. For no reason. And, but he ran it. For no reason. But he, but he was fast. Oh, yeah. And because he was hor- he, he gave horizontal movement to our offense. Mm-hmm. Foster stretched the field, and all of a sudden you saw an offense that looked halfway competent. Mm-hmm. It was incredible. Foster, 20, you, you talk about his acumen for catching downfield. 21 yards was his average depth of target. Number one, I think, uh, what did they say? Number one in the NFL of wide receivers of a certain class. I don't know. I, I saw it on, it was one of those things this morning in my cold medicine just haze. I saw it, I'm like, there's no way. But you look back, 21 yards was the, so when Josh Allen was throwing to him, 
he was already working down the field mm-hmm. against these cornerbacks who were having a really difficult time catch, uh, covering him. Yeah, He had seven catches of more than 20 yards. Yeah, so Foster, a player like Foster brings a lot of dynamics that are troubling to defenses, right? Because he's got that great long speed. So you got to keep a guy over the top on him. And a lot of teams thought that, well, we'll just go with one safety in the in the deep end and we'll keep, you know, a guy down in the box to to stop Allen from running, right? That was the solution, right? Let's keep a guy down in the box. Well, when you have a player like Foster, you, you can't always do that. I mean, there's not many corners in the league who can keep up with them. Not to mention size up with them, right? He mm-hmm. at six two. I mean, he's not your typical speed receiver. And the cool thing about Robert Foster is that he's under team control for years, mm-hmm. like years. The league had their chance at him when the Bills were bouncing him up and down from the practice squad. Any team could have signed him, any team, and nobody did. And he, the Bills were able to move him up and down off the practice squad and on. And uh, next year, he'll be on the Bills in 2019. Uh, in 2020, he becomes an exclusive rights free agent, which means the Bills just basically have to offer him league minimum, and he has to sign it. He he either signs it or he doesn't get to play. That's it. So the Bills own his rights in 2020. So he's I want to say team I, I want to something. I, I misspoke. Not nine touchdowns, six six touchdowns, and they were on the field for nine of the touchdowns. Our passing offense this season only scored 13. Yeah, 13 passing touchdowns yep. or receiving touchdowns. In a season, and your offensive lineman caught one of them. Yep. Your starting left tackle caught one of your receiving touchdowns. Mm-hmm. And yet, these guys managed to carve out a niche and be on the field for the majority of those plays mm-hmm. where they were executed properly. Right. To me, that's huge. Now, you two multifaceted players that we own for a long time, yep. they're cheap yep. but effective. You gotta love what they brought to the table this year. Absolutely. Jordan Phillips, under the radar guy, doesn't get a whole lot of love, but I'll tell you, the, a defensive tackle, which is it's a position that Sean McDermott loves to rotate. Mm-hmm. We only paid him seven hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars. Nineteen tackles, twelve of them solo, two tackles for a loss. At less than a million dollars a year, if you have a rotational tackle who's going out there, who's being effective against the run, who gives you a little something every now and again in terms of quarterback pressure, not substantial, but he's a guy who you can ro- rotate out there when Star Latulule needs a break. And you're not, the drop-off isn't as significant. Mm -hmm. You need that. You need guys like that. The fact that we have one that only costs a million dollars, Yeah, that's a steal Mm -hmm. in this team. Getting him off, I think we got him off waivers. We did. From Miami. Yeah, Yeah, from Miami. So you got, these are other, and we got McKenzie off waivers when the Broncos cut it. Yep. We, to Brandon Bean's point, you had to dig deep. You had to try to find some guys. Right, because... but, I mean, it goes back to your initial point of, you know, look at these front office guys who keep climbing the ladders of other organizations, and that's the reason why. So yeah. even with the, with the season the Bills were able to put out, look at the talent they found, right? Yeah. And it's not – this isn't a best-of-the-worst situation. These players would be competitive on most NFL rosters. So this yeah. isn't – I mean, you're not looking at a, a 0 and 16 team. You no. know, you're not. You're looking at – uh, real solid NFL talent that when you can work the system like this, you can keep those guys for a long time at a really affordable, affordable rate. Well, since we're talking about really affordable rates, linebacker Lorenzo Alexander makes yep. my list this year. 74 tackles, 55 solo tackles, 11 tackles for a loss, and six and a half sacks for $3.6 million. Isn't that crazy? I mean, first of all, he's an ageless wonder. This guy is a freak. I don't understand how at his age he's still coming out here. I mean, the thing that I see year after year that I think is ultimately the thing that impresses me most about Lorenzo as a player. You know, a lot gets made of the fact that he's played so many different positions. Mm. But he genuinely is the guy who will go out there and do whatever the staff requires him to do. He will be the player you need him to be. Mm. So with that, as his, you know, because we, we've identified the fact that last year, one of the big uh, big things that hurt our defense was when we were forced to play more Lorenzo Alexander. Teams abused him a lot in coverage. You know, r- running backs out in space, mm-hmm. uh, slot wide receivers. You couldn't play him in nickel packages, but sometimes you had to. Yep. So, so now with Milano and Edmonds here, his role changed, and he embraced that role. And they essentially said, look, we want you primarily around the line of scrimmage. We want you as almost an extra D end out there mm-hmm. in a 3-4 defense. And he went out there and performed because it's what he does. He embraces 
you know, as he slows down and as his limitations get bigger, he just finds new ways to keep doing the things he's good at. Yeah, you saw, and to your point, man, you know, once you lost Milano, that exposed a ton of holes inside yes. that linebacker group. And you asked Lorenzo to move inside. And that's, I mean, that's a big, that's a big change. And um, he still, he still sees things really well. You know, mm -hmm. um, he has good forward motion. He's still strong at contact. But he doesn't have the lateral skills. And that's why you saw the Patriots just absolutely roll us with Cordell Patterson on those jets. Exactly. They're running him up against Alexander because they knew that he would see it, but that lateral movement, he might, he probably isn't going to get there. Yep. Um, and that's, you know, and that's what happened. That's why those plays were so effective because they could get outside of Alexander. Now, Alexander, I completely agree with you. Um, from a salary standpoint, if he wants to be on this team next year, it's going to be in a rotational, hand in the dirt, defensive end guy. I yep. do not see him, um, you know, playing linebacker next season. You know? I, I don't see it, but at the same time, I think he would stick with with what he brings from a leadership standpoint, especially with the losses you sustained. You need Kyle's him. gone now. Got to have him. I, I'll whatever it takes to keep him here, but at the yep. same time, he, we got what we got from him last year at three and a half million. Yep. If you told me he could do that again, I'd have him back in a heartbeat. Yep. And then probably the the crown jewel. You want to talk about uh, just studs for no money? Quarterback Trey White. It cannot be understated how much this kid does. At just two point two million dollars on the season. Rookie contracts, man. That's and you look at what the Bills are doing. They're acquiring draft picks, draft picks, draft picks, draft picks because they're cheap. They're yep. so cheap. You know, it's yes, they're all on guaranteed contracts. So let's say you draft a guy in the second round and he and he, you know, it turns out to be Chris and he just doesn't work out. And you gotta cut him. Right? You have to pay the rest of whatever that contract is against your salary cap. So it burns you there. But the long view of it, man, oh my god, it's so, so, so much better from a cap standpoint to have all these rookies. It really makes a big difference. The only problem is if you draft like garbage, because then you start having tons of cap penalties for guys that aren't on your team anymore that you invested a second, third, fourth round pick in. Um, you know, they, they start blowing you up a little bit. One cap value that you haven't brought up yet that I, I have to I have to say impress me from a value standpoint, you could not you could pay Jordan Poyer another five million dollars and he'd be worth it. He had a hundred oh, tackles this season. Absolutely. You, his, his cap number I think was like three eight. Yeah. Like people don't nothing. understand how it's underpaid peanuts. our safety group really is when you peanuts. look at the, when you look at what they're producing out there. The secondary as a whole. Yeah, we got awesome. While well, he was healthy, Teron Johnson mm -hmm. was just a baller out there. We for call us. him Jughead. Do you know why? Why? Because at the NFL Combine, he was the one that took the football off the side of the head. He looked at the jug machine. He looked at the wrong jug machine first, oh, and he no. didn't. And he realized it. And he turns around. And he gets the football right in the head. Oh my so we, god! We call him Jughead. Poor, poor bastard. You look at what we've done. Levi Wallace. Levi Wallace comes out off the practice squad. Again, yep. another Alabama guy. Thank you very much. Um, who? Yeah, I wonder where they got that idea. Just show, Yeah, right. <laughs> who just shows up and over the course of the season works his way onto the field and turns out he's one of the highest rated rookie corners to play this season. Yep. And that's what I'm getting at here, I guess, is there's members of this secondary, which is the backbone of this team. I think one of the biggest things working for us going forward is that we're not tied to crazy dollars for any of these guys, mm -hmm. at least not for a few years. I mean, inevitably, Trey White is going to command a salary. Say what you want. His season was a little bit up and down. The kid gave up, what was it, 0.68 yards per coverage snap. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Fourth in the entire NFL behind Patrick Peterson, Cody Sensabaugh, and Avante Maddox, who's really interesting because you saw him in the Eagles game last night if you were mm -hmm. watching the playoffs. He was a fourth round pick. Yep. So that's it. You take fly that's why every year you see teams drafting DBs. It's because you don't know when these guys are just they're the Levi Wallace is the world who don't even get drafted. And you mm -hmm. sign them to your practice squad and they come out and it turns out they're just effective corners. You like know, that one time that we uh, drafted uh, Ross Cockrell and then Pittsburgh signed him. <laughs> yeah. And then he went on to be an <laughs> yeah. effective starter for yeah. four years. Yeah, and we caught him. Yeah. yeah. That was great. That felt great. You know, this speaks a little bit, though, to the identity, right? So you look at the Bills from an offensive standpoint and a defensive standpoint. The Bills have an identity on defense. They know what works. They know who will fit the system. They identify that stuff quick because they looked at Milano. They said, this guy, 
that this guy will fit the system that we want to run. They looked at Mar Dean Marlowe. They looked at Poyer. They looked at Hyde. They said, this, these guys will fit the system we want to run here. We have enough tape on them to prove that these guys fit the identity of what we want to do. They played Moneyball. Right. They played Moneyball. Unfortunately, they have no identity on offense. They don't have a clue what's going to work yet. Well, and part of that stems from this. Now, before we change gears here and we get to we talk about the people who I've you probably heard a lot of their names already. Talk about the people who, from a cap standpoint, represent terrible return on investment. Before I get into that, it's worth noting, throughout my research for this show, our offensive line was bad this year. Yeah. We, I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's, yeah. saying it's bad is like saying that Chris has personality flaws. <laughs> like, that's the kind of understatement we're talking about here. But with that said, the Bills spent less than twelve million dollars. It was eleven point six million on their entire offensive line. It wasn't group. like four of it, Russ Bodak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on their whole offensive line group, they spent twelve less than twelve million. Yeah. To put that in perspective for those of you listening at home, the Dallas Cowboys are a premier rushing team in the NFL. They spent thirty-seven million. Yeah, and like 19 of it's on their left tackle. There are 11 offensive tackles that make more than the $11.5 million yeah. per year yeah. that the Bills spent on their whole line. Yeah. T- Taylor Lewan, the left tackle for the oh, Tennessee God. Titans. Why did you say Taylor Lewan? Makes $16 million a year. They spent $5 million more dollars than we did. I, 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 I think back to critical moments in the Bills franchise history in the Sammy Watkins draft comes to mind because I remember sitting there salivating at the idea that the Bills were going to draft Taylor Lewan. I was just salivated over uh, it. And then they trade up, and I was like, He's, they're see, not doing it for Taylor Lewan. And, that, and, that's, why, and yeah. that's why setting yourself up for failure heading into the draft by spending poorly in free agency yeah. doesn't do you as a franchise any favors. No. Because that's when you end up with Sammy Watkins trades and yep. other nonsense that goes on. The league average in offensive line pay was $23 million. And there are only two teams in the NFL that spent less on their big uglies up front. The Jaguars and the Cardinals. One of them is coached by Doug Marone and has, I think, the third overall pick. Mm-hmm. The other one is the Cardinals, who has the... They spent $2 million. Mm-hmm. $2 million. Chris, why is their coach fired? Gee, I, I can't imagine. Oh, wait, your offense bottomed out and hung your team out to dry? I can't imagine why. Yeah, and they fired Mike McCoy like week. Four or five. Yep. <laughs> I mean, you had, you had David Johnson, who was just couldn't do anything all season, man. But he had no, no space. That but line at, was awful. But at least, so see, at least there's some accountability here on our end, yeah. as far as our team is concerned. The GM knew what he was doing. He knew what he was getting into. Mm-hmm. Versus a franchise that says, "Well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to draft this rookie quarterback." And then, you know, we're going to roll them out here behind this line that we literally, literally got from the thrift store. <laughs> we taped it together. They went to the thrift store <laughs> and just tried to find all, like, it was like when you you were to go to a place like that, like Amvets, and just try to find something that, like, I want, I'm looking for jackets that don't smell. Yeah. That's, that's all I'm looking for. <laughs> if you're a, I don't care how you fit, if you're a jacket that doesn't smell and you're under a buck twenty five, all right, you're coming home with me. Yeah, it's like, it's like that scene in Major League, like, <laughs> Mitchell Friedberg. Who are these fucking guys? Yeah, right. <laughs> I know? think this guy's dead. Cross him off the list. <laughs> That's then. right. Exactly. Yeah. So it felt like they it felt like they attacked the offensive line of, Air, of the Arizona Cardinals by just like jersey numbers. So like, oh, this guy's must be must be a center. He's wearing sixty four. Must be a center. Sixty four. It counts. What, what's your salary? <laughs> That's probably how they had the interviews, too. They just yeah. called around. How much did your client want? All right, next. How yeah. much did your client want? Yeah. Oh, he'll take half a million. Done. You're my yeah. guy. League minimum. Why don't you come to Arizona? Well, it's and nice this time of year. And unfortunately, there was members of the Bills team this year who should have been getting paid league minutes. Oh, my God. Folks, the worst cap values for the Bills in 2018. i got to start the list off with Charles, with Charles Clay. Oh. It, it starts oh. with this guy. You are a tight end in the NFL. 36 targets and 21 catches. Fifth on the team in catches behind McCoy, Zay, Foster and Benjamin, if you can believe that, behind Kelvin Benjamin in catches. He had zero touchdowns in 13 games, but they paid him $9 million. $9 million! And 4.5 next year when they cut him. 
Oh. He's going to be 4.5 in the cap next year. There's no way Charles Clay's coming you back to Buffalo. You can't score no. You cannot get paid $9 million on offense in the NFL anywhere. I don't care what team it is. And not score a touchdown. Yeah. Not one. Yep, not one. I mean, Charles Clay is the product of the Bills being really ballsy and trying to stick it to Miami. Um, you know, that that's what happened, right? So the Bills ended up with Charles Clay because that was back when Miami signed and Dominican Sue. Charles Clay was was a free agent, and uh, you know Miami put a put the the transition tag on him, so he was able to go get offers. And the Bills made him an offer that Miami literally couldn't match. The whole reason this contract is the way it is was because they said, you know what, let's stick it to the Dolphins, let's stick it to them. We yeah, got the right. money, let's stick it to them, and this is where we are. I'd say the Dolphins were laughing at us, but they just drafted Mike Gesicki, and he spends more time rolling around on the ground than he does on his feet trying to block. <laughs> I think it was somebody on Dolphins Twitter pointed it out. They're like, watch, watch. There's Wingfield. Oh, yeah. Wingfield has put up gifts of, was, of well, Gesicki not blocking. Well, not even not blocking, but they're like, even during his routes, he just falls down. They're like, at least one out of every three plays that he's on the field for, whether he's blocking or whether he's out in a passing route. It's like yeah. Der- it's like Derek Roy trying to get a penalty. Yeah, you but just, I mean, you how, turn around and the guy's just on the ground for no reason. But how much does the national media pay attention to Penn State football? I mean, not much, right? They're not paying attention to Penn State football. No, no. you can get away with a lot out there. <laughs> Another guy who just, and I mean, this one you could you could probably make an argument that maybe I'm wrong, and maybe you will, Paul. Trent Murphy. I'll say this: Trent Murphy's salary came in at four point eight million, which doesn't seem like it's that much. He finishes with 24 tackles, four sacks, five tackles for a loss, and nine quarterback hits. That's not a terrible stat line if you are a rotational player. Yeah. But that's not who you were signed to be. No. That's not, when you look at the contract as a whole, that's not what the contract is constructed for you to be. Yeah. And, and so I think it, he makes twice what Shaq Lawson did. But finished behind Shaq Lawson in every single one of those statistical categories. Yeah, and he's almost eight point six million dollars against your cap next year. So you know you start taking a look at all the money the Bills have, and everybody goes, "Oh, you got ninety million dollars. Do what, do whatever the fuck you want." You can't because you you do have some dead weight here, right? So you oh. cut Charles Clay. You, there's four point five. You cut Trent Murphy. That's three point five. So now, I mean, you just spent nine million dollars to get guys off your roster. You know, well, well, and that's, that's, that's it. You know what? You're opening up a good. You're, I'm glad you brought this up because you're opening up the next line of conversation for me. Chris, I mean, we beat the... I would bring up Kelvin Benjamin here, but I feel like, Chris, can you vouch for this? We've beaten the Kelvin Benjamin being the worst the worst monetary value in the NFL. Uh, yeah, Kansas, just awful. Kansas, Kansas since, City's the same way. Since they jacked beers up to $13 for a can. Just awful. I, I mean, he, him dropping that ball in that game. Oh, in Kansas City? <laughs> Nothing made me feel better as a Bills fan than watching Kelvin Benjamin just absolutely fail. It's like, ah, oh, good, so you still suck. I'm yeah. glad to see that. Yeah, I'm glad it wasn't just the jersey. But so Perfect. That, that brings us to another another line of conversation. And this is, when you're talking about guys who, your manipulation of the cap and guys who are here and things you still have to deal with, there are going to have to be some hard conversations had with some of these players who are either going to have to be restructured or cut altogether. Mm-hmm. Come on, sweetie. No, don't be a bitch. Let's talk some numbers here. I mean, I think at the top of the list is the guy we were just talking about. You're talking about a Trent Murphy. He's set to count $5 million against our cap next year, but we only take a $2 million hit for getting rid of him. Or no, we save $5 million. We save $5 million because I think his number jumps up to 9 and he's worth 4.5. Yeah, so his number is 8.5 next season. Yeah. So if you cut him, it's 3.5 because, again, signing bonuses yeah. are king here, right? Okay. So it's 3.5 is what you're looking to pay to get him off your roster. Okay, so so you could save a few million dollars there. So if he's not willing to restructure, which he has no he has no he has no obligation to do so. Right. There's no incentive for him to do it. He might as well just let us cut him. Yeah. Because I I just didn't see the production this year. Yeah. If you if the bills cut him, I mean he's taken a million two million dollars someplace else. Like nobody's going to sign it for anything. You bills could cut him and then resign him later with absolutely no problems. There's, and I mean, there's some other really obvious ones here. I mean, obviously Chuck Clay, we save four and a half million if he's if he's released from the roster. Then you get into some other, some more obscure players who I genuinely feel like the team needs to look into. I don't even think most Bills fans think about it when they think about, hey, who can I jettison from my roster and save a little money? I'm going to start off with uh, Patrick DeMarco. I see that. Patrick DeMarco. 
He's a guy who, when we signed him, now this year he counted $2 million against our cap. Yep. When we signed him, I, he I was... Think I, you're, you're calling him, his name is, remember, it's Captain Patrick DeMont. <laughs> he is a captain. Let's not forget how important this is. Captain Patrick DeMont. He was coming from Atlanta after having made a Pro Bowl there. You know, he had, he put up 110 yards receiving, multiple touchdowns, I think six touchdowns that season. He was being used creatively all over the Falcons' offense. So when we signed him, I genuinely thought that this was a... It didn't work because the way McCoy runs. You said it before. Yeah. He, you, you have, a, you know, your, your play, you know, go out and DeMarco's going here to hit this certain hole, but McCoy just has vision and thinks he's got a better chance over here. And then it defeats the purpose of using DeMarco. Yeah, McCoy in an eye back situation just doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, this right? is the it thing. just doesn't. And I think that maybe he was. Well, here's the thing. This is the second time that this DeMarco makes the second time that this franchise has signed a Pro Bowl fullback to block for LaShawn McCoy, and it hasn't worked. No, because you can't block for him. He's creative. He he improvises. That's what makes him so dangerous. But that's what also makes the a traditional blocking fullback irrelevant. Which is why I thought that his signing here was going to mark that he was, he was, he was going to signal some kind of reinvention, some creativeness on our offense. We were going to find creative ways to use him in the passing attack, and that he was going to become a guy who can make an impact on a game to game basis for us. Instead, he finished this year with four targets in the passing game, mm-hmm. one single rushing attempt, and it, I mean he didn't. He's a non factor when it comes to trying to block for anybody. So with that said, I just don't know what you're doing paying a guy who you can still save $1.5 million by releasing him. Who says you need a, t- a fullback at this point? We don't utilize them properly. We don't have personnel that dictates that one is necessary. You could use an H-back. Yeah. That would at least be more useful because that is your third tight end who can come into the backfield on certain plays. But he still gives you that flexibility, sure. Scheme wise, yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm with you a hundred percent. And you know, it's it's important to remember that Patrick Demarco never ran the football before he got to Buffalo. He no. had one career rushing attempt in what six years before coming to Buffalo. Like one. Like this is not a guy who touched the football in the running game. Like that's not that's not his role. And a lot of people think fullbacks are Mike Allstott, and I mean that. Oh, he was one of my favorites. That's. That that guy's not that guy's gone now. Yeah, those There's guys no, are they're, they're gone. Anymore. They don't exist anymore. If we're handing the ball off to Demarco, it's not good that he's had one carry in six years. Yeah, he comes to Buffalo and we start handing him off the ball. Now he's got to learn how to hold the ball. He's not going to learn from McCoy when he holds it like a loaf of bread. <laughs> no, nobody should be learning how to hold the ball from uh, yeah, Michelle how do you, McCoy. How do you take this this handoff? Oh no, you just you just grab it and then you hold it out here to your left like you're carrying a loaf of bread. No, and so. And while we're on the topic of blocking, and you're talking about just rushing, our rushing suffered this year. Russ Bodine, you save $2.3 million if he's not on the roster next year. Now, he plays center, which is a, it's vital to the, to, to the success of any offensive line. And the guy next to him, Vlad Dikas, another guy who saves you $2 million if you remove him from the roster. There is an overhaul coming to this offensive line. Oh, without a doubt. So with that said... That four point three million dollars goes a long way towards getting you another roster player, another if not a starter, a rotational guy that you throw in somewhere on the offense or somewhere on the defense. I just don't see these two guys making the cut. Yeah, yeah, you know, you make you make a great point. Um, so Bodon was brought in here with McCarron, right? Yes, because they were both came from Cincinnati. It's rocking the T-shirt today, I feel the AJ McCarron vibe very strong. Oh, so, Jesus. <laughs> Well, hey, the Seagrams run, run strong. Um, so, uh, Bodine was marked out as a below average center before he got to Buffalo. Yeah, the, I mean, the, there was no Bengals fans crying no, over Russ Bodine leaving. No, not at all. And, you know, the one thing that I've learned about the NFL draft is that, um, it was specifically in the last four years, is that centers, nobody wants them. It, you can get a, you can get a starting center in the second round of a draft. And that's what I just see this team finding a way to overhaul some of these positions up front because mm-hmm. obviously the failure of our offensive line was to a it was a huge detriment to the entire offense, mm-hmm. especially when you're talking about a young quarterback who's still just trying to find his footing. Mm-hmm. I think the most controversial name on this list, though, the one that if I was going to get into an actual out and out argument with anybody over any one of these potential cuts or restructuring demands, it would have to be Lashawn McCoy. Now. 
there's a lot of people out there who might think that, hey, it's a foregone conclusion with whatever what he's owed versus the fact that we only would it would only cost us a million to two million in dead money to get rid of him. Yeah. This is what GM Brandon Bean had to say at his end of season press conference. But I think it was our entire running game. I don't think it was just one person, uh, you know, to single out LaShawn. So, um, you know, you saw some plays he still made yesterday. Uh, I think if we can improve in other areas, you know, that will help LaShawn early in the year. Our pass game was not very good. Uh, you could see it. Teams were focused on, all right, if we stop 25, this team's not going to go far. And, you know, we while we did improve our pass game, uh, our run game stayed stagnant for, for a lot of the year. So, again, uh, LaShawn will come back in 2019, and, and we'll go from there. You know, I'm not a believer that LaShawn is done. And um, I know you're talking about his numbers around $6 million. Um, if he gets back to the form and we get our offense going, I think he can still be a weapon. End of season press conference for Brandon Bean. Go watch it. BuffaloBills.com. So he comes, LaShawn McCoy heads into next season with a $9 million cap hit, making about six in cash, and it's only a 2.6 hit to cut him yep. in dead money. Yep. You're talking about a thir- who will be a 31, 32 year old running back coming off his career worst season in yards per carry, touchdowns, yards per game, he's, receptions per game. He struggled across the board in every facet of football. Is it dangerous that they're still banking on his upside? You know, I think there's a little bit of gamesmanship here, right? Because, and I'm, and I'm being completely serious here. We know that LaShawn sometimes doesn't make the best decisions in the offseason. Okay? I want you to think of what would happen if Brandon said, you know what, we're going to come into 2019 and we're going to take a look at the running back position. Right? LaShawn thinking that he's going to be unemployed soon. What does an unemployed LaShawn McCoy do during the offseason? How much trouble does he get in? Is this, is this at some point being trying to salvage some sort of value to say, listen, LaShawn, you're in our plans. Don't screw up this offseason <laughs> because he still does retain some value. I mean, no, no, he's a talented his, player. Right, it's because just... if, if you want to trade him, you eat $2 million. The next team that gets him only has to pay him six, right? So he's yeah. affordable in that respect for another team to take a chance on a one year. Okay. So, I mean, you could make the case that LaShawn could be traded, but what, what kind of offseason are you going to get from an unemployed LaShawn McCoy or a LaShawn McCoy who feels like he might soon be unemployed? What the hell could happen there? So I think there's a little <laughs> bit of gamesmanship here with Brandon being trying to salvage some value, um, regardless of what their plans are. I think it goes to what you just said about the center position, that you can find a good center in the second round. You can also find a great running back in the second, third, maybe fourth round. Absolutely. And I think this year they're going to attack that at the draft and find uh, Shady's replacement. Well, they're, they're in no position right now at that running back position because you have, what, a 31-year-old? I mean, Ivory and McCoy are the same age, I think. So you have mm-hmm. a 30-year-old Chris Ivory. <laughs> Marcus Murphy's 27. He's no spring chicken either. And And if he was going to be, I mean, I'm a huge Marcus Murphy fan, but if he was going to do anything and establish himself, he would have done it by now. I mean, you're talking about a guy who is a decent special teamer. He's not bad in a pinch if you don't have any other choices. But at the same time, he still can't pass protect. Oh my god! No. Around, he's, he's, he got he almost got Allen killed a handful of times. If you don't like your quarterback, you leave Marcus Murphy in to pass protect. Yeah, yeah. You, Patrick Demarco should not be in single back sets to pass protect. No, that should that is that is not that is not a good thing. I mean, truth be told, you look at Lashawn McCoy next season cap wise, third highest paid running back in the NFL behind David Johnson and Todd Gurley. Is that who he is? No, and that's it's my not, point. Right. So do the. I understand the hey, we have a dynamic running back talent when he's healthy, when he's ready to go, when he's got good blocking up in front of him. But even at his best, he's not Todd Gurley. No, he's not David Johnson. Not anymore. He's no, he's not Ezekiel Elliott. He's no. not any of these guys who are going to be paid at the level he's currently being paid. Right. So to me, that sort of feels like a mistake. It yeah. does. That feels like you're being nostalgic or. Ma- Maybe not even nostalgic. Maybe you're just saying, look, I can't hemorrhage all my playmakers in one offseason. And as I'm breaking down this entire thing, somebody still has to be here. Yeah, I mean, if what would you rather do, bring in a rookie running back behind a completely rebuilt offensive line? I mean, what good does that do you? 
right? Yeah. I mean, seriously, what good does it do you? You could argue, you could make that argument. I mean, there's there's going to be a lot of these arguments that we're going to have coming up here because we are heading into 2019. What I regard as probably the most important off season in recent history. You go back an off season for the last six or seven years through the last two regimes, Doug Whaley and Buddy Nix. I can't recall one that felt this important to the direction of the franchise as a whole. We're coming into it with what eighty three point eight million right now without cuts. Yeah. If if none of the cuts we talked about, they could get as high as ninety five. Yeah, and, and and also, you know, you also have to figure in the fact that the salary cap often increases, yep. and it's just kind of a guess. I mean, if I had to guess, the Bills are really, without any roster moves, going to be about $93 million. And, and so that puts us about third in the NFL? Yeah. Third in the NFL in cap space. Yeah. We're going to have the ability to move, to move around and do things, and we kind of came about that the hard way. This is what Brandon Bean had to say about it. Back to the salary cap thing, we knew that we had to – you got to hit on some free agents, you know, undrafted guys, some paying some guys lower level. There's only so many dollars to go around with that much dead money. Uh, and, again, that's why I take an onus, a big onus, in this record, uh, probably as much as anybody in the building, you can put the target on me um, for the calculated move of the cap. But that's fixed. And, you know, going forward, we'll be able to operate and not have to worry about, to Sal's point, worrying about, Releasing a guy just so you can get into free agency and make some moves. It's Brandon Bean from BuffaloBills.com and his postseason presser. I like that he's owning the fact. It's nice, isn't it? It's, it's nice it's to hear some accountability. It's he refreshing. says, look, I know what we did. This is, we, we did this thing. and I, You can put the target on my back. If you're pissed off about the fact that the team went 6-10 and 10 with, a under, with a wildly underperforming roster. They knew what they did. He essentially handed Sean McDermott a cinder block and asked him to tread water. Mm -hmm. He said, look, I don't even need you to swim the pool. I just need you to not drown. And I think to a certain degree they did that. Yeah, it, there's no surprise that the Bills were slumming it in 2018, right? <laughs> you know, that's just all That's all there was to it. That's 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 what they're in. That's what they had to do. Um, but I mean, Paul, Paul's, Paul loves that term. I mean, he does hail from Lockport. Oh, oh, oh and there it is. There it there is. There it is. <laughs> um, yeah, but you know, the problem that I, I have a little bit with the Brandon Bean comment there is, uh, you know, and I appreciate him taking accountability because that's definitely something that Doug Whaley never did. Doug Whaley's like, yeah, you know, contracts? I don't know. I don't sign the contracts. Oh, that's like, not my job. That's I don't, not I don't my job. Negotiate those. Oh, my God. So, I mean, it is refreshing to hear a GM say, yeah, this was on purpose. Yes, we did this thing. It was on purpose. Um, but at the same token, the Bills are in a really precarious situation because they have to actually spend money. That the CBA requires them to spend uh, a certain percentage of the salary cap, right? Now it's not down to a percentage every year, but it's in a four-year rolling period. The bills have to spend ninety-nine percent to the cap the next two consecutive years to not be in violation of the CBA. So they can't do this whole let's just keep drafting thing. They gotta spend money and they have to spend money. Now, well, I think that I think part of it hails back to you know what he talks about. You, whenever you listen to him talk, he talks about a successful franchise's approach to the draft, hopefully setting themselves up to take whoever the best player available is. Mm -hmm. you know, for all of our holes, I'm hoping that we can find ways to address those things intelligently. Mm -hmm. Because you think about how many times you watch a team like the Packers go into the draft and you think you know what their holes are, and then they draft a cornerback with their first pick, and you're like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. Right. No, it does, because they're just going off their board. They're saying, we want talented players, and we've built a team that's successful enough we can get away with that. Because you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of different philosophies you can take into the offseason. You can be the team that just spends like wildfire. Like you're saying, they're going to have to spend money. But you can be the team that just goes big you know, trophy hunt, you know, tro big game hunting. You, know, you want those that trophy game. You want to go get yourself a Mario Williams, a Khalil Mack, and you can be the GM who goes out there and tries to land the the biggest names on the free agent market. I mean, we've watched the Miami Dolphins win the offseason how many years out of the last 10, and they've never succeeded doing that. Or you can be the team that just tries to you know play it cheap like we did this year. That's another philosophy you can approach it with. And try to moneyball your way to a successful team. It's refreshing to hear Brandon Bean talk about his philosophy and have it make sense to me, somebody who understands it, and to just pe people who don't understand things like salary cap and 
know, draft value and things of that nature. Judicious is probably the word I would use instead of aggressive. Um, you know, if you're not wise with it, you can be back to where it was when I walked here, walked in the door here. Um, so we definitely want to fill holes in free agency. Um, I think I've said it before. Uh, you use free agency to help you so you're not going to draft, you know, in April with all these holes. And now you're drafting for need. I promise you, drafting for need is a mistake that can set franchises back. And I'm not going to do that as long as I'm in charge here. Brandon Bean, end of season press conference over at buffalobills.com. I mean, I hear that. And that's, it's good because it's, it underscores the fact that he understands what he did. But it's one thing to tear something down. You know, I say this to my friends all the time. I'm, I'm a pretty handy guy. I can fix, I can do a lot of my own work around the house, things of that nature. I am better at destroying things than I am at building things. If I'm going to build anything, you know, if you said, hey, Drew, I need some demo work done in my kitchen, I have an 18 pound, a 14 pound, and a 12 pound racking hammer. I'm very good with them. Crowbars, pry bars. I'm very good at tearing things down. If you ask me to come into your kitchen and rehang all your cabinetry for you, good luck. Or your <laughs> good luck. Or your body. See New Year's Eve last year. Yeah, yeah, where I fell where through the wall. You fell through a wall. You fell through a wall? Yes. You How do I not know this story? You did not know I, was, this? So I don't know this story. The Tell Bills, it. The Bills have just made the playoffs. I've, oh, yeah. I've been drinking. Okay. I'm having a good time. Somebody puts the shout song on the on the. We're at my friend's house, which is like which is like your which is like your intelligent person kryptonite. Yes, when the Bills making the playoffs, and the, shout the, playoffs. Song. I, the shout songs on you. You oh, I'm like a piranha with blood in the water. I mean, it's, <laughs> I'm dancing around his basement, just jumping around, and somebody had walked in with shoes on, and there's a puddle of water in the floor, and I slipped in it. I have to make. No, we're at a New Year's Eve party. I have to make a split second decision: Do I fall? into the table, possibly destroying all of the food and ruining the entire party, or do I take my chances with just falling shoulder first into his wall? In my head, what is the worst thing that could happen? Drew looks in that picture like he's sticking his head out of a drywall vagina. It's this The hole in the wall, folks, my entire body was in another room. My ankles were sticking up out of the other side. I fell through the wall. And that kicked off New Year's. Hey, what a way to end 2017. Drew's here. Yeah, Drew's here. <laughs> now it's a party. So note to you guys, don't uh, ask me to fix anything for you and don't invite me over when the Bills make the playoffs because uh, drywall, sheetrock, compound, unless you have those things on hand, I wouldn't do it. But so with that said, I, I just, I look at it and I'm saying, here's a, here's a GM who's telling me his plan. And it makes sense. But now you have to go build it. Yeah. It's one thing to say that you're going to do it and say that you know how to do it. It's another thing to actually execute it properly. They've done some things. We touched on it. The, the way that they've been able to find the Levi Wallaces and the Robert Fosters and Isaiah McKenzie's, guys, the way they've been able to find guys like that and identify people who they think can come in and help tells me that maybe they do have a solid, a solid uh, what do you want to call it, talent evaluation. They've got solid metrics in place for all this stuff. At the same time, I look at some of their whiffs, and I just go, what, what is this? Mm-hmm. Do I trust you? Right. Do I trust you keeping Patrick DeMarco around? Do I trust you fielding a roster that on special teams was, I mean, you can blame the coordinator, yes. The job of a special teams coordinator is to motivate the people out there. That said, you still have to have competent special teams players. And the fact that our depth players were that bad... It was bad. That underscores the fact that maybe you're not to be completely trusted with some of this stuff. Our wide receiver core. Again, and you can tell me it was calculated, but it shouldn't have been that bad. I would be a billion percent shocked if the Bills didn't go out and sign big contracts to Mike Ayupati, who's coming over from Arizona, or Roger Saffold, who's coming over from um, the Rams. These are these are guys who've been around the league a long time that you can pay a lot of money to who are accomplished and will solidify the inside of that line. Because I think, you know, when you take a look at it, if you're looking at drafting a center or you've got Ross Bodine as your center, you need to insulate that position a little mm-hmm. bit because he's not excellent, right? He's not. He's not a Pro Bowl center. He's not excellent. And this season, he wasn't insulated at all. 
And that center position was tough. And the guard position was tough. And Dawkins was exposed because he had Teller next to him for, you know, the last six games out of the season. Like, there were a lot of problems here. And don't get me wrong, I like Wyatt Teller a lot, but I'm not putting my faith in Wyatt Teller nailing down a position for this offensive line. I can't do it. I need to sleep at night. And that's why this approach is going to be really interesting to watch play out. Because what I'm looking at is this. If we're just having a conversation about where do they spend the money, Mm -hmm. you've got needs at wide receiver, at tight end, and on your offensive line. Yep. On the other side of the ball, you're going to need D tackles. Mm -hmm. You're going to need them. We need bodies. You need special teams linebackers to go out there and play special teams. You need defensive backs to play special teams and back up. And maybe, maybe you need a kicker. I'm just putting it out there that Stephen Hauschka had a rough year. You yeah. can blame some of that on the consistency of the people holding the snaps. I for think him. that's an underplayed. I think that I think that's underplayed a lot. Okay, well, you know, I, I think saying, it's a great point. I'm just floating it out there that you. So then, who's your backup quarterback? Who's your play? Then get a better placeholder. There needs to be some... Did you just say use the backup quarterback? Do you realize who the backup quarterbacks were every week? Well, that's my point, though. I don't <laughs> care like who it is, care. what we had this year. So as I look at where we, where I see us spending money or wh- what my thoughts on just, not even individual like, specific players, but just where I think the money should be delegated, I've got some thoughts. First and foremost, stay away. This team has to try to stay away from, quote-unquote, name wide receivers and free agency. You can't do that. Chris, At all. Chris, Peerless Price. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> peerless Price. Let this me was run, a decade ago. Let me run another couple names by you. Des Bryant, Demarius Thomas. Okay? These are guys who got paid to the tune of 10 to $12 million a year and then ultimately within a season or two weren't effective for their franchises at all. These, there's a, wide receivers, they're luxury picks in my mind. You, you draft wide receivers. You sign a wide receiver in free agency to big money. Mike Wallace, another guy. Mm-hmm. Giant bust in free agency. 33 years old, too. I'm willing to put money on the fact that if I had time to break down the metrics on it, you would see more free agent busts at wide receivers paid more than $7 million a year than you saw success stories. Look at this. If you go to Spotrack.com right now, wide receiver Devin Funches, who is essentially a tight end glorified into the wide receiver position, they're estimating he's going to command between eight and a half and nine million dollars a year. This is nine million dollars for a player who's never hit a thousand yard receiving season, never caught more than sixty percent of the passes thrown at him, and he's only averaged more than forty yards per game once in his entire career. But because of the way free agency works and the way the market operates, he's going to get paid over eight million dollars a year. Yeah, and Devin Funches again. You, I mean, you. It, I mean, it doesn't take a forensic scientist to draw the conclusion that he came from Carolina. So, well, I mean, it's... But my point is, is that there are guys who are going to be out there on the market getting paid salaries that are not anything close to their actual on-field production. It happened, you can, it happened last year with free agency. And the way that they're hiring offensive coaches as head coaches, mm-hmm. I just think they're going to end up overpaying for receivers and, offensive pay- and I don't want being spending a whole lot of money on for big contracts for people like Devin Funches and overpay like Sammy Watkins to Kansas City overpaid. I don't want to see us doing that in free agency this year. There's no Robert Woods. Right, so we we talk about Robert Woods, and I mean we can romanticize oh, he's the about Robert value. Woods. He's yeah. the ultimate value. And when wide he receiver. signed that contract with the Rams, I went, "Oh my God, that's a huge!" They're paying him like a number one wide receiver. But you look, the salary cap's gone up like ten million dollars a year. He's not getting paid like a number one wide receiver. No. He was for a year, not anymore. It's not that that market's gone now. Yeah. So I mean, you there's no Robert Woods in this free agent class. I mean, you look at from a. a Somebody that young, that talented, they're not here. No. They're not. And so I mean, that's my point. I don't want to see this team chasing names mm-hmm. in the wide receiver position because it's it's been proven out over the last few years that more often than not, you end up getting the short end of the stick. Yeah. To this point, and this affects wide receivers, use and defensive backs, safeties, use your money on non-skill positions. This team, this team had guys like Robert Foster's and uh, Isaiah McKenzie's that they found off the scrap heap that were at least functional. You're right. You want better talent than that. 
But you could draft wide receivers who could probably perform at that level, if not better. My fear, when I look at te- what separates, I, I call, I, a few minutes ago I said luxury pick when yeah. I was talking about wide receivers. In my mind, if you do not have an offensive line and a defensive line that both operate cohesively, you have no business spending money on, on the wide receiver or the running back position. You just don't. Case in point, look at the Colts since they drafted Andrew Luck. Over the la- over the first four or five years of Andrew Luck's career, call it four years, that team drafted nothing but skill players. They took multiple tight ends, wide receivers year over year. They traded away a first-round pick for a running back. Does that even make any sense? And you look at the Colts. Have they been competitive outside of one AFC championship? No. No. They're wasted. They have a generational quarterback, and they are wasting the prime years of his career because they've drafted nothing but skill positions. Really, those are luxuries. Those are what you go out and obtain when you think you're one or two players away from winning a Super Bowl. Or for making a deep playoff run. You know, if you're the Chiefs, you go out and you sign Sammy Watkins to a $14 million contract because you have an inkling that Patrick Mahomes needs one more playmaker to really make this offense pop. And when you get that, it's going to make you a true contender. That's it. You make that move because you're in that position. You don't make that move when you have an offensive line that just got paid $12 million and is a fucking (laughs) sick. You don't spend that money when you've got DNs that can't, consistently generate pressure when your D tackle position is kind of up in the air right now because you've got a second year player who was a rotational guy, another rotational guy in Jordan Phillips who sounds like he's in negotiations to come back, one starter at Star Latoule who's a space eater, and he's nothing more than that. You can't afford to go throwing crazy money at skill players like cornerbacks and safeties, running backs and wide receivers when your business in the trenches is unsettled. That should be where this team focuses its attention. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I, I struggle to disagree with that, right? Because, I mean, if you don't have time to throw, then, dear God, what are you paying a wide receiver for, man? Thank you. You know, like, you're Oakland, right? I mean, Oakland's a perfect example of what happens when you have name wide receivers and nobody <laughs> protecting the quarterback. Because Oakland was bad this year. You have Jordy Nelson, you have Martavis Bryant. Not none of them could neither. Amari could Cooper. It had Amari Cooper, season. and Cooper goes to Dallas, and now looks like he's an all-world player. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, there there were there's definitive problems in Oakland, but they're not that far away from the problems that the Bills have when you don't have a line. The line controls everything within an offense. Oh, absolutely. And the Bills the Bills are in no position to be spending tons of money on the wide receiver position. Although that's what everybody's going to say is everybody says the Bills need a big, tall wide receiver. Well, then you're going to go and you're going to sign Kevin White to a two-year, $2 million yeah. deal because that's going to be what he's able per- to afford. But he had Perfect Kevin example, White had four receptions this season. You Perfect know? Perfect example. Look at what Brashad Perryman is doing right now for the Browns. Yeah. he A, a failed first-round draft pick yeah. of the Ravens at wide receiver. He gets cut. He goes to the Browns. He kind of finds it. It takes him some time to find his stride. But down the stretch there for the Browns at the end of the season, all of a sudden, Brashad Perryman starts... He starts catching touchdown passes. He starts becoming more and more prominent in the passing attack. A change of scenery is sometimes all it takes. And so sometimes you can find talented players. It doesn't. There, there's no rhyme or reason to why some guys don't work out in some places. I mean, look at Robert Woods. He's a perfect example. He didn't work here in Buffalo, but he's flourishing in L.A. Mm-hmm. Well, he has a better offensive system out there. He has a much better quarterback situation. Better, off, better offense as a whole. He fits better as a cog into that offense than he ever did here in Buffalo. Well, and he really helps that run game. Absolutely. He's just nasty. So that's he's my nasty point. nasty on the outside. He's more effective simply by changing teams. He immediately becomes a much more effective player than when he was on this team just because his fit here wasn't right. Well, and I don't want to say that the Bills didn't try because the Bills certainly did try. You know, like they brought, in, they brought in Corey Coleman because why not? Right, that, you you bring you have Kelvin Benjamin and you have Andre Holmes, and on paper these guys should be dynamic players, but you, those are the guys that show up on the weekends. And so, know? and so, and I think those moves all underscore the fact that this franchise is well aware of the problem. Oh yeah, they know it's a problem, and it's going to be really interesting to see how they try to address it. Now, you said, to, and this kind of ties into this theory of how do you go about addressing that position then if you're not spending a ton of money? You floated an idea to me off air about restricted free agency. 
and how the Bills are set up for it this season that I found really interesting. Yeah, so one of the things about restricted free agency and kind of the way that that works is um, a lot of people will be familiar with it as Bills fans with Chris Hogan yep. and Mike Gillisley, right? So what happens is when a guy's a restricted free agent, the team can tender them a contract and put a draft pick value on that. So what happens is another team can come and offer them a contract, and if they go with that other team, then – the uh, then the bills in this instance would get um, you know would have got got draft pick compensation right mm-hmm. with Gillisley and with Ryan Groy and with and with uh, Chris Hogan the bills got draft pick compensation for that well the bills have way more draft picks than they need right they've got ten draft picks they're not keeping all of them there's no way in the world that this front office is going to take all ten of these picks it's not going to happen so one of the best ways to spend money is to spend money that other contracts that other teams sign players to. So, um, like, restricted free agents are awesome. Like, just to give you an example, Josh Gordon's a restricted free agent. Now, I think Josh Gordon's NFL career is over, but the fact is you could acquire a player like that. Um, you know, Martavis Bryant is out there. He's a restricted free agent. Geronimo Allison from Green Bay, he's a restricted free agent. He's a really dynamic receiver. I really like Geronimo Allison. Um, so there's guys out there that you can get for flyer draft picks, mm-hmm. right? And there's also guys who are veteran players that you can get for the same. Um, you know, once you hit the NFL draft, teams just love those fifth, sixth, and seventh round picks for whatever reason. And, um, man, you can get some good players for that. You really can. And the Bills are in a great position with so many draft picks that with restricted free agency. Well, and we have the cap flexibility. Exactly. So. so if you want to offer somebody that's a restricted free agent a five-year, $50 million deal, and it's going to cost you an extra fifth round pick to do it, do it. Who cares? That, you could, you, you, you could got the cap, you got the, you have the capital to do it. Yeah. So the Bills are in a really cool situation with the fact that they really no players off market for them. Mm-hmm. Every player in the NFL is in market for them, even if it's going to cost them draft picks, even if it's going to cost them a ton of money up front. Doesn't matter. Every player in the NFL is on market for the Bills. Guys, I've I've said it, and I'm going to keep beating this horse. I I firmly believe that this is going to be one of the most important off seasons to this team in recent history, and I think it's going to be one of the more exciting. I mean, you're talking about a front office that finally, they accomplished the step one of their goal, which was get rid of every other regime's bad debt. Let's, let's, we, it's like a company filing Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Now they're coming out from underneath it and they're saying, okay, we're flush with cash. Now we have to rebuild the image of this team. Even with 50 million in dead money, Chris, and 12 million spent on our offensive line, we won six games. Shockingly enough. Yeah, we beat and, Minnesota. And some of them by a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> right. there's there's reason for hope here. Now it's just we have to trust that the guys who seemingly to this point have been the smartest guys in the room over at One Bills Drive, hopefully they have a plan and hopefully they can execute it properly because if they do, I think you could see a large jump in the performance of this team They're going to do year it. Last year. They're going to do it because in a year from now, you're going to be drinking to Seagram's because we're going to the playoffs. Yeah, Chris is I'm already not, mandating yeah, playoffs. I'm, I saw I'm, that on the yeah, board. I'm yeah. already gonna. I'm gonna be. I should be saying that every <laughs> show. We're going to the play. Like, we're going to the playoffs. Oh, oh, man, folks, I don't know about that. Folks, before we get to that point, we have plenty of content coming up. We've got our free agency series. We've got our wildly popular draft series. I know uh, Matt Waldman will be joining us to speak running backs. We've got. Uh, we we just tap a lot of. You know, Mark Schofield. Yeah. Guys who in the draft community are super knowledgeable. They're friendly guys. They're fun to talk to. And at the same time, they don't mind that sometimes I get a little bummed because I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm the guy who said Ryan Mallett was going to change the face of quarterbacking in the NFL forever. I don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to the draft. I will fully admit that. I hated the last three Bills drafts. I hated them. Who looks like an ass now? Well, I mean, it, the precedent was pretty strong. Well, thank you. <laughs> the precedent every draft, was pretty strong. Because historically, every draft I've ever gotten excited about just came back to just came back to bite me in the ass. So you're like Danny Batten. Yes. Oh yeah, this sounds like a steal. <laughs> Terrell Troop. Yes. So Nailed I, it. So then I see Matt Milano, and I go, Matt Milano. He's a small linebacker out of BC. <laughs> <laughs> what do I care about that? Oh yeah. Well, who's I've had to eat so much crow over the last few years. I'm looking forward to this year's draft series just so I can I'm going to sit back, I'm going to relax. I'm going to help we're going to have intelligent draft conversation with people who actually know what they're talking about. And I'm going to keep a lot of my negative opinions to myself. That's it. When it comes to this draft, I'm going to keep it to myself at this point. Can we just talk for a moment how Mike Mayock got a general manager job? Oh. 
It's going to be the best, folks. We the, Forever, we've said, if these draft guys really knew what they were talking about, some NFL team would hire them. It's You're happening. Finally, <laughs> we are finally going to get to see this thing play out in real life, and it's going to be hilarious. I can't wait. One yeah. way or another. If and he's, they don't have final call. If he's amazing, if he's amazing at it, I, I'm going to love every second of it. And if he bombs, it's going to be one of the funniest things it's on earth. It's still going to be great. There's uh, no losing here. Folks, we've got so much coming on the pipeline. Thank you so much for joining us week in and out. Paul, Paul, hashtag sports, where can people find your stuff? Uh, that's at H tag sports on the twits. And, and uh, or I was going to say, and right now, are you watching reruns of the last four combines? Yeah, I actually take the combine off. We talked about this yes. before. I take the combine off of work. I take those three days off. I'm sitting there, and I just I love everything. You people make me sick. Yeah. You know that yeah. the combine yeah, and mock drafts. The, 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 the combine and mock drafts. You people make me sick. You're telling me that when Byron Jones jumped out of a building with a 12, 12 foot three inch broad jump, that you didn't get like a little giddy? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I got for you. I, get the, I got your 12-foot uh, broad jump right there. So getting back, Hashtag Sports you can find on YouTube. Uh, so and That's uh, uh, Hashtag Sports on YouTube. It's pretty easy to find us on uh, Facebook and all that stuff. So, yeah. All right, Chris. we got to get the hell out of here. Guys, thank you so much for stopping by. I'm Drew Gear. That's Chris Krueger. That's Paul Wineski. And this has been the Rock Pile Report.